Hey everyone, and welcome to the Hormone Genius Podcast. Uh, we have the pleasure today to be introducing Dr. Cheryl Hansel. Uh, Dr. Cheryl Hansel was born and raised in small town, Northeast Iowa, and she decided that she wanted to become um, a doctor out of the altruistic uh, part of her humanhood. Um, she had childhood cancer, and so that gave her perspective on life. She got her bachelor's at Iowa State University and an MD at the University of Iowa. Family medicine residency um, after that, and then graduated in 2000. She practiced the full gamut in ER, the hospital, at the hospital to nursing home and obst to obstetrics. So she's really drawn to taking care of the woman, and we're so excited to hear how the Holy Spirit led Dr. Cheryl Hansel on the path she currently is on now. She's a medical consultant with NAPRO Technology, um, and now she's working at Mercy One um, in Waterloo and serves as a, uh, the board president. Uh, for the Guiding Star Cedar Valley Center in Waterloo. So Cheryl, we are so excited to have you on today. Um, and how about just introduce yourself to all of our listeners to get us started? Thanks, you too. Um, I'm so happy that you're doing this. This is amazing. And I've listened to several of your podcasts. So I so appreciate you both. Um, so yeah, I practice in Waterloo, as Jamie said. I have been in practice for 20 years. I can't believe it. I have a wonderful husband who was actually my high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And then we have two adopted children. Um, Faith, who's 14, is a freshman in high school. And Levi, who is eight. Um, Faith is actually Guatemalan by birth. And Levi is Chinese. And they're two great kids. And I'm practicing at Mercy One, as Jamie said. Awesome. Well, Cheryl, tell us um, about a little bit about, I'm kind of curious, um, you know, you mentioned becoming a doctor and how your childhood um, cancer basically was part of your desire to maybe help others. So why don't you lead us into that a little bit and then how kind of your practice has changed over the years? Yeah, a lot. Um, yeah, I uh, had a neuroblastoma at age one, which thankfully I don't remember any of it, but my parents, as I grew up, um, I have wonderful parents and I actually lost my dad about three years ago to cancer. There's a lot of cancer in our family, but they just affirmed my life as I grew up. And so I always had that appreciation for the body and I always felt fortunate to be able to help others. And so I came from a medical family. My dad was actually a large animal veterinarian and my mother's a retired nurse. And so that basic interest in how things work physiologically was always a curiosity. So there led the path of onto medical school. Um, and then since then, um, my mom has just been such a pillar of strength in everything that has happened. And so she really has affirmed my decisions and change over the years. Um, to just tell you a little bit of how I got here, I started out in family practice just because I like everything, but I was really drawn to obstetrics at first and did that when we didn't have any children as of yet because of how busy it is and loss of sleep, of course. But I just remember helping couples fertility wise and didn't learn much about it in medical school, unfortunately, as you know, that's commonplace. But I remember teaching couples the basal body temperature charting and helping them achieve pregnancy that way. And it was actually pretty successful, surprisingly enough. But um, we actually had our own infertility journey at that time and mm -hmm. lost two sons. And so obstetrics was kind of a sad, happy place for me at that time. I remember sometimes delivering a baby to someone who wasn't so attached and then being done with what I needed to do and going to the other room and bawling my eyes out just because that was such a difficult experience for me. But life has always been something that has been precious, I know. So after not being able to do obstetrics anymore, I actually joined the practice at our local university. And that's where I met Jamie. Mm -hmm. Jamie came into my story then. It's an amazing story. And at the time, I guess I'll just kind of share a little 15 second excerpt. Um, I didn't know Dr. Hansel, Dr. Cheryl Hansel really well at all. Um, I know she went to the church that I went to, but never had like a real conversation with her or didn't know her super well at all. But 
I was doing my research paper, paper as a master's student. So I was trying to collect names of medical professionals in the community that would just take a call with me. Mm -hmm. And so I had a, a standardized set of um, interview questions and I would ask like, what, you know, do you share fertility awareness systems with your patients? What do you know about fertility awareness systems? And I remember um, with Cheryl, she was the only one that knew what I was talking about. <laughs> it was crazy, but I left a message for her to give me a call. Um, and then she did end up calling me back. And that's where that story ended for me in that, in that moment, the story did not end there, but in terms of my own mind, you know, she was just one of the doctors I was calling for this research project. I didn't realize what was going on the other end of that phone call. Um, and maybe Cheryl, you can kind of share a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so when I got to the university, that was an, uh, obviously a narrowed setting for family practice, but I loved being able to help women in that age group because there's so much discerning going on. But when Jamie called me that day, of course, my first reaction, silly enough as it was, was, oh, honey, I don't know how far you're going to get because in this community and just everywhere, those we are not taught enough about that in school. It's just drilled into us as to how the pill or what have you, artificial contraceptive is the fix for everything. Mm -hmm. But that phone call stuck in my head like you wouldn't believe because I thought, oh, why is someone asking me this? And this is so interesting. And yes, why can't I do more of this? But as I got to meet college women along the way, it my heart just was broken as to how little they know, and I'm generalizing when I say they, about their bodies. But then on the other hand, I felt this tug at my heart as to how much I might be participating in that in a negative way. And as I had encounters with patients over the ensuing eight years, it really affirmed for me how we aren't doing things well to teach women about their bodies and take care of them as a result. So Cheryl, it, it, are you kind of saying at that point in your practice, like you would be prescribing, you know, birth control for medical reasons and um, kind of using the standard Western medicine approach to treating women's health issues? Is, is that kind of what you're referring to? Correct. And um, startlingly enough, I realized not that my education was, I got wonderful education, but there was a huge gap. Mm -hmm. And I grieved at what I had not learned enough of and therefore wasn't able to share with women enough of that as to how our natural bodies work and alternatives to that um, because as we well know artificial contraception is used for so much. In the university setting of course um, I would get asked for contraception often while at the same time trying to counsel women about their choices um, but it would always amaze me as to the choices that were made as a result of being on that medication, even if it was medically indicated, it makes women view their bodies in a different way. And then I believe out of that, make choices that maybe they wouldn't otherwise have, or perhaps they were never taught by the generation ahead of them, how precious their fertility is and to live in reverence of that. There were a couple of women I can recall distinctly who had had their first sexual encounter and referred to it as something they needed to get over with, mm -hmm. as opposed to something they were preparing for physically, spiritually to be a sacred moment. It wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. And that was very sad. Yeah, Cheryl. Um, what yeah. would you say is a, a, a story specifically that really sticks out? You know, you were saying how, you know, there are these kind of convicting moments and these questions of why was, why didn't I learn that in med school? Did it seem like then those experiences with women that you saw after that really kind of more stuck out? And if so, could you describe a case where you were meeting with a woman and maybe you were startled by her comments or um, felt extremely convicted one way or the other? Yeah, two in particular. One in a very positive light, I was inter interacting with a a young woman who hadn't married yet and was just thinking about her fertility and, and how she was going to manage that over the years. And we were talking about contraception in particular because she was very open about asking wonderful questions. And she said point blank to me, she said, Dr. Hansel, if I start 
the pill it was in particular. Can you promise me that I will never ovulate? In other words, that I could never conceive and then possibly um, have it act as an abortifacient as one method. And I looked at her and I said, no, in all truth. And she said, then I don't want it. And she just really asked wonderful questions. On the other side of things, I encountered a woman not too long ago who had had an abortion fairly recently. And she was coming to me because she was in a new relationship and she wanted contraception because of that relationship. And I wasn't at the point yet where I had stopped prescribing. And now I look back and wondered why I did. But when I left that encounter, my heart just said to myself, is history going to repeat itself? <laughs> and so many times, well, the last two years I was there, this country broke records each year in the numbers of sexually transmitted infections. And we know in college women, still about 2 million college women become pregnant during their college years. So they aren't foolproof. Mm -hmm. yeah. How was it? It's a good point, Cheryl, because yeah, even the Guttenmacher Institute, you know, reports every year that 50% of women who have an unplanned pregnancy are taking contraception in the month that they achieve that pregnancy. So, right. you know, humanity is, is not, you know, we're complicated people and it's just not as simple as throwing a pill or a device at humans and just saying, this is all going to work if you just do this, mm -hmm. um, because it, it doesn't it's complicated and, and sex is complicated um, and relationships are complicated. So it's just not that easy. Right. Yeah. How, how would you say it was working at the, at a college university serving women in that, you know, atmosphere? Yeah. I loved it. It's such a teaching um, opportunity if you have those opportunities to take. Um, and that's so important um, even starting younger is so important, but that was the opportunity that I had. And I felt like some women that I was teaching just about their basic body functions and findings, that their eyes would be open to things they hadn't heard before. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. I mean, isn't it true? And we, Jamie and I talk about this a lot that, I mean, we, we are very passionate about women understanding their bodies because it integrates them into themselves in a way that just doesn't happen if you don't know how your fertility system works. And, you know, a lot of women in making their choices, they can't make good, healthy choices about their body when they don't understand how it functions and they can't respect the goodness of it if no one told them the gift of it and how it works and how it's central to their health as well. So it's just so eye opening always to me. And I, and I love that too, in my own practice in educating women, how, how you can really see a woman's not only eyes open to the actual knowledge, but to the respect that they can gain in knowing that their body is whole and that their fertility is a part of them that we should cooperate with. We don't need to shut it down. We don't need to ask it to go away. We don't need to tell them that it's a broken thing, that it actually is something is just as a woman, a part of your wholeness. And, and that's what's a, a very unique, don't you think, position to take in even the medical world. We tend to want to tell women this part of their body is somehow um, something we need to treat differently and to actually try to damage it or manipulate it in some way. Mm -hmm. And to care for it. And then it's amazing how their partners um, in turn care for it because of that awareness that comes out of the woman knowing themselves, which is also amazing. Cheryl, I want our listeners to know that journey. So you we're in the um, college setting, you know, you're working with these women, you're using this kind of time to, in a sense, form them, you're, you're feeling more and more convicted in your own heart and mind about birth control and that kind of thing. Um, can you, can you share with our listeners kind of how you got from there to where you're at now? Mm -hmm. So this burning question that Jamie presented to me, continued to burn in me. And I felt in my heart that I was doing things the wrong way. Um, but 
as many of us who have made this transition, I felt trapped. I didn't know a different way of doing things. And that's what I grieve now, that I wasn't aware of that. But in time, um, I was able to see a different path. Um, Jamie had already been trained as a fertility care practitioner and the spark of Guiding Star Cedar Valley was in her. Um, she had actually come to me about possibly becoming a medica medical consultant sooner than I had been. But at the time, um, I wasn't in my own practice. I wasn't financially independent enough because of that to be able to sustain joining Guiding Star and doing that. But there were a couple of patient experiences that converted me. And she, um, then Jamie, informed me about the St. Paul Paul VI Institute. And um, the last patient experience I had that sort of snapped the twig was a gal that um, I ended up giving artificial contraception to. And I didn't know at the time, but about six months later, I encountered her again and she happened to be on a blood thinner. Um, and I said, what happened to you and why are you taking this? Um, and she was a young woman that was 18 and her mother who was a retired nurse had never told her about their familial clotting abnormality. And she was completely unaware when she initially started and the poor girl ended up with a huge pulmonary embolism mm. um, and was on blood thinners because of that uh, and really had a hard time breathing for quite some time. Um, after witnessing that, I had to do something differently. And then unfortunately I was working in a, in a setting where the type of counseling that I would do with patients in a life affirming manner, um, I was talking with a patient about her, her purity and what that would mean for her. But I don't think in ever hearing that message that she felt initially comfortable. So she mentioned something to an administrative person who then came back to me and said, you can't counsel patients that way. If um, a person comes to you, that person needs to be sent to a counselor. And you need to, if you're going to continue working here, you need to prescribe contraception. That wasn't in my contract, but it was said. But at that point, I couldn't continue. And it was not long after that that I took the education phase at the St. Paul VI Institute, became certified, and here I am two years later not having prescribed anything artificial for three years. It's quite a different way of practicing, but I love it. And it's so rewarding. <laughs> That's awesome, Cheryl. And yeah, just, just so our listeners, you know, understand that that, you know, young girl, it was the pill that caused that blood clot. And this is often something, again, that we don't talk about, but a lot of people either don't know their family history, or they don't, even know that they have a blood clotting inherited disorder. In fact, it's up to about nine to even 11% of the population that have um, an inherited genetic disorder in that area. And you could be inadvertently putting yourself at significant risk for a blood clot on taking these medications. So it's very unfortunate. And obviously she's at least alive. Um, right. Some of those situations end up with patients not um, right. ending their life. So um, very dangerous birth control can be, and it's just important that people get informed consent and know exactly what the risks are when taking any medication like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, you know, I love NAPR technology and, um, and I practice and I have for 20 years, but what's so amazing is, is that so many people have been in your position, um, Cheryl, as a provider where they may realize at some point that this isn't healthy for women anymore. And and what they're doing actually, they don't know how to practice um, any other way. And of course, then there is the fear of what will, it'll, what will happen financially for you? Will you have a job? So there's a lot of like leaping out in faith and taking those chances and going into a practice now where you're upholding a standard that's very different or against the grain in Western medicine. So just give me an idea of, again, what, what has the freedom been like? Or what was it, was it hard in the beginning? Um, has your patient size decreased? Has it grown? You know, what can you share with other people out there who may be feeling that this is something they want to do, but they're fearful because of what may happen if they choose this path forward? Mm -hmm. It was a fear for me. Um, and there was a period of time where I didn't have any 
finances or income just because I chose the training and I was in a job transition. But it wasn't very long. And I would say it has been so worth it. And I don't think my panel has decreased at all. In fact, I would say, even just by word of mouth, there are so many women that are curious about this. And once they hear about it, realize, why wasn't I ever taught about this, even in middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. And so those people that just want a different way to handle their cycles, that is natural or cooperates with their body and then also have interest in learning more about their fertility for planning their family. It's been a wonderful journey. That's great. Isn't it yeah. so amazing? Like any, any medical person listening, whether you're a doctor, nurse, anything else, I want, I really want to put this into perspective for everybody. Okay. So whether you're, I guess you're a medical person or not, the, the courage it takes to step out and do something so different because of this inner compass and this inner voice, um, the courage it takes, but when you say yes, and when you say, I'm going to do it, like, I can't ignore this voice. I can't ignore this inner calling. It's just like, you know, Teresa, with your question, you know, that freedom that follows the freedom that comes. And I'm sure Teresa, like, or I'm sorry, Cheryl, um, would you have to say, would you say that like, even just the weight of that, um, experience in your past professional life, you know, how much of that weight is now gone? that you just were, what you're carrying. And it's huge. That. In, in some ways I had to, I felt like I had to say sorry in my own mind to those patients that I never informed about this mm -hmm. and grieving that I didn't give them that opportunity. And then for myself, it was so freeing because after I was trained, I thought there's such a better way to do this. And you're going to learn so much more about yourself. And that in itself just is empowering for women because they can live um, such a, a more whole life with themselves and their partners and families. Your impact you're making even on the staff that then have to wonder when they're taking a, an appointment for you, they're scheduling it and they're saying, you know, the, the perspective um, patient, you know, oh, I'm having these issues. I have progesterone issues. I need to talk to Dr. Hansel about NAPRO technology, like just the fact that that ripples into all those you work with as well, because of course, you know, as a doctor, you're not an island, you work with the team. And so I also just see that impact being made. Um, can you speak to that, Cheryl? Like, what have you noticed just in working on your team, um, those opportunities to share what you're doing? Mm -hmm. They're curious, which is good. And it does plant a seed of doing some things uh, in different ways. It also allows them the opportunity to say, have you ever thought of, and then send people my direction. It also affects my medical colleagues. And um, then some of the nurses have even started to say, can I learn more about this charting you're talking about? <laughs> That's awesome. So, yep. Beautiful. And um, Cheryl, I just, you know, I, I was really um, moved by the fact that you have adopted you know, children that you had a story um, of your own that was infertility and that Teresa, that Teresa, also... stop, 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 sorry. Um, Colin will have to uh, start that sentence over. You sound like an uh, alien. Did he, she sound mm -hmm. weird to you, Cheryl? A little bit. Um, whatever happened between the last time you talked and now, it seems like weird. Like you sound like E.T. kind of. Um, it might be your... Do you have headphones in? No might have been my now I can't hear you at all hold on just oh no I can't. even the last time you were talking it sounded a, there was like a little wisp you know but it wasn't like that the whole time but then this last time it was worse so I just wanted to yeah I bet it's that Eddie will disconnect We can't hear you at all. Can you hear us? Nope. Hmm. I wonder what happened. That's so weird. Oh, okay. I can hear the background noise. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. 
Okay. Okay, so you can hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Does that sound alienish? It sounds good. Nope, it sounds good. So if you okay. start with that last question, Colin will know when to you know snip it and start mm -hmm. it. But you just had started talking. Um, so maybe just start at that very beginning part again. So Cheryl, you know, I was really moved by the fact that you had your own kind of journey with infertility. And now that you've adopted two ch children, that seemed to be something that was a part of your heart. And also, I don't know what drew you into kind of understanding your own body and how it wasn't working the way <laughs> that, um, you know, that it is intended to work in terms of having children. So just a little bit more in your heart about how that has really, um, I guess, helped you even with um, helping other patients along mm -hmm. the way. Yeah, very much. Um, it really opened my eyes to the possibilities of family. No one else in my family had ever adopted before. And um, going through infertility, of course, is its own um, ups and downs process. And so I think working with those couples now has really provided some insight for me with their emotional roller coaster that they go on. But Adoption has been a wonderful journey for us. We have great stories to share with our kids. Um, and it also helps me, I think, in counseling women making their own choices when pregnancy is unplanned or unanticipated because the door is so open for life-affirming possibilities and many women aren't open to that, but certainly can be. Mm -hmm. so. What would you say since um, becoming a NAT Pro trained, um, you know, we talked about the, how, how there's this freedom and how the team is kind of curious now, the people that you're working with, but in terms of just serving um, women, like, is there a story or two that sticks out in your mind now of an uh, impact you know you're making now with these women you're seeing? Yeah, um, I think the, the most fun I've had is working with pregnant women again, because there was a gap in there where I didn't anymore. And since I'm not doing obstetrics, I'm really seeing women right when they're pregnant, um, after they've figured out what's going on with their cycle and where there's help to be needed. And then lo and behold, a pregnancy and how, how happy they are. Mm -hmm. That is so fun. So mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. And do you feel like the, that there's healing or, or do you feel like there's been that journey for healing with your own loss almost through this? I think so. And I'm, I tend to be, I tend to wear my heart on my sleeve, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So I'm very open to sharing about things too. But um, I think the compassion comes out of that. And now that I'm older and it's been some time, I certainly almost wish I would have met Dr. Hilgers then who knows mm -hmm. what there might have been with surgical possibilities for me but I've lived the journey I have and I'm very thankful yeah it's awesome mm -hmm. okay so um what couple questions I have before we wrap up here so in terms of just the state of women's health care um what would you say like are your general feelings uh on just healthcare as it's seen by culture today. And what would you say um, is something that we can do collectively as a culture to kind of shift the needle, move the needle so that we all can understand more so the dignity of our feminine nature? Yeah, I would love to see every middle school girl learn how to chart their cycles. And I think I've said this to you before, Jamie, and both of you as fertility care practitioners, would appreciate that. I've shared with Jamie that I have my daughter who's now 14 and my niece who is 18, both charting. And my niece actually happens to be a childhood cancer survivor too. So that will open the door for her fertility, whether she has issues with it or not in the future. But because of that, they're aware of their bodies. They're aware of the normal names for the parts of their bodies. They're aware of their emotional ups and downs with their cycles. And even though the word mucus is adversive, they'll still say white flow or red flow. And she's very comfortable with telling me what time of the month it is. And I can tell when it is, but it's just so empowering for them and it's normal for them. So going forward, I think they have that appreciation right from the get go. We have a huge generation gap to deal with, of course, with moms my age who never learned that and learned to start 
their daughters on the pill right away at age 14 for difficulties. And so I get big eyes from moms who will hear me say, sorry, I don't do things that way. I want your daughter to learn this. There are great ways to do things without that. May I teach you? And that's not naivety, that's empowerment. So I hope we can change the tide here. Mm, Cheryl, me too. Yeah. What would you say um, you would wish every young woman knew about her hormone genius? Yeah, I sorry, I got cut off. Okay. Wish every girl would know that their hormones are genius and that it would tell them what's going on in their body. Just like I mentioned before, how they can learn. Mm -hmm. I'm so thankful for you both. <laughs> and it's true. Um, you know, Dr. Um, Hansel and um, Teresa, they, they work with patients working with the couples who are working to avoid pregnancy naturally, achieve pregnancy naturally, uh, women who struggle gynecologically. And so the way this works is that there are people like me, fertility care practitioners, um, who spend the time, we sit down with the couple, they, we help them understand their, their cycle, we help them chart their cycle, um, and then we're looking for patterns. And when we see an unusual pattern or maybe some unusual bleeding, maybe there's been um, you know many months of not achieving pregnancy when they're trying to, then uh, like Dr. Hansel and Teresa and many other NAPRO technology doctors are trained and suited to then kind of take that handoff from us to then kind of dig deeper, do lab work and really work out um, with them on that medical end. So that's how that works. In case you're listening here and, you, and maybe this is your first episode you're listening, um, just know that that's what that is. NAPRO technology is nat natural procreative technology. It's the medical science. And then fertility care practitioners are people like me. We're not um, medical doctors, although there could be medical doctors and trained professionals who also have this training as well. So if you want to learn more, fertilitycare.org um, to find a fertility care practitioner or a NAPRO doctor closer to you or close to you. Um, Teresa, do you have anything you want to share um, before we wrap up this episode? I just want to say thank you to Cheryl. And I totally agree with you that, you know, it starts with education. Education is empowerment. And, and that's why we're doing this podcast, obviously. But there's just so much that needs to be done. And I'm just grateful for physicians like you who have stepped out and made that leap um, to really believe that the woman's body deserves better. So thank you for that. And yeah, let's just continue to you know work together as a team and more and more people who hear this are gonna jump on board and find new and unique ways to bring this information to every young woman who's out there. Awesome, thanks. Love it. thank and you. And medical doctors, professionals, if you're hearing this and your heart is burning and that inner compass <laughs> is kind of tugging at you, um, do not, do not um, fear reaching out to us. It's the, the least you could do. I mean, just one small step, reach out to us, see if we can get you connected to someone close by. You may not have even known they existed. Somebody who's practicing in this way, um, we can connect you to that network that we're really associated with. So if, again, you feel a burning in your heart let that be a sign. Reach out to us at uh, the hormone genius uh, at gmail.com, or you can go to hormonegenius.com, scroll to the bottom of our website, and then leave uh, a message for us there as well. So uh, Dr. Hansel, thanks again for taking time out of your busy life to interview um, with us and answer all of our questions and share your beautiful story. And Teresa, it's good to see you as always. And to all of our listeners, we look forward to sharing more with you in days to come. Thanks, guys.